Good morning. I just want to welcome all the guests here today and also our online viewers. Uh, welcome. And we're going to open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just I thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you, Lord. Um, I thank you that uh, you've brought us Pastor Corey and his family, and I ask that you just bless this service today and just open our minds and hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You think after 16 years I'd be able to figure that out, huh? Okay, is that coming through now? Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'm the former lead pastor as of uh, uh, a week or two ago, and uh, so thrilled to be able to have uh, Pastor Corey Murphy join us this morning as uh, he begins uh, serving our congregation here in New Holland, Pennsylvania. And, um, and so what we're going to do just for a couple of minutes here, uh, we're just going to introduce uh, Corey and Becca and their family and uh, allow them to share a little bit of their story. Um, uh, we had a number of Zoom calls uh, a number of weeks back, and uh, some of you got to to hear some of their story and how you ended up sort of landing here, and um, but some of you didn't get to hear that, so it would just be a great refresher, and there might be some other little bits that you can share along the way as well. So I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, how are you wanting to handle things there, but we'd love to hear a little bit of your story and Becca's story as well. Yeah, sure. I'll invite my wife to come up, and if the kids want to come up, they can as well, see if they're cooperative. But um, yeah, so this is Becca, uh, my wife. We've been married for almost nine years, and this is Carter. He's all of like 35 days old, so he's, he's a little guy. And then we have Owen and Anna. Owen and Anna, you can come stand up next to mom. There we go. So yeah, so we had been a part of uh, Gateway Church. Uh, we got hired there about eight years ago, and I was in that context as a student pastor and children's pastor for um, six years. And then we left to go plant a church in Pottstown, which is where we still currently live. Um, and we did that for two and a half years. And then uh, I didn't know it was coming, but Pastor Tim gave us a call and said, hey, we're looking for somebody and this is the criteria, this is the description, and we think you match that. Are you interested in having that conversation? And, and we talked it over and we said, yeah. And so it was really cool to see how God kind of walked us through that um, process. And, and now we're here. And if yeah. I can interrupt here, um, uh, having the opportunity to meet Corey, I think we have a couple of pictures actually, if we could get them showing up there, Scott. Um, we have a couple of pictures from, um, from, see if we from can get them here. Uh, there's one oh, there. Yeah. That, is, um, that is from uh, about five years ago, uh, down in yeah. the Gateway Church office. Uh, Corey was part of the cohort that we meet together with. And then the next picture there, I think, shows one of our gatherings at uh, Shady Maple. Uh, some of you recognize Pastor Brad in those pictures with different hair. Uh, we joke yeah. the fact that his hair went from the top <laughs> out the bottom of his chin uh, a whole lot further. But uh, So it's been a pleasure to be able to interact with Corey during that cohort. And that's where I had the opportunity of being able to get to know him, get to be able to observe him in ministry, get to to be able to interact with him and be able to appreciate the man of God that he is. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really cool to be part of that process. Do you want to share a little bit about just how we met? Sure. Uh, let's see. So I was done my freshman year of college, came home, and um, I had gotten saved while I was in college that year. As When I came home, I had kind of been looking for a new church to plan to get part, to become part of, and my mom awkwardly introduced us and said, can you help her meet some people? <laughs> and uh, so he was at our house because my brother and him were in a band together and they'd practice in our basement. So we met through that, then served through youth ministry over at East Brandywine Baptist Church. And um, I think it was like a year and a half that we dated. Then we were engaged for about a year and a half. I went to Penn State, so it was, we were long distance. He was over at PBU, now Karen. Um, and so after that time, we got married when we were done college, and that was back in 2011, which feels like five minutes ago. Um, but yeah, now we have three kids. I was going to say five minutes and three kids ago. That's how That's long right. ago it was, right? That's true. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. But yeah, so we're really excited to be here, and uh, it's been awesome to kind of see God's plan. I have a really long story about how I think God brought us here that starts with us working at Red Robin. So if you ever want to hear that story, we can hear that story a little bit later. But yeah, super excited to be here. No, that's awesome. And um, just uh, for those that are regular part of Grace Family Church, um, know that uh, uh, Corey is not a 
a duplicate of me. Corey has his own set of um, wirings, and, and that's a good thing, isn't it? And so not from Australia. Okay, either, not from so. Australia. You're going to hear more about that soon as well. Um, but uh, Corey, um, Corey has a has a different gift set that God has given him, and I personally believe that the gift set and the wiring that he has is what our church needs right now to take us into the next phase of our ministry. And so, um, those of you that are regular part of Grace Family Church, um, you might find that. Second, uh, uh, this doesn't quite feel the same. Well, it shouldn't, and, uh, and it's a good thing. And uh, I, I do believe that the gift set that Corey has is going to help propel our church in a, in a fresh way. Um, uh, if you remember, when I, my, Heidi and I came on board here. In pr some pretty rough shape, and it's been a journey of uh, of uh, 16 years to sort of uh, I don't know figure out some stuff and bring our church to a particular position. And Heidi and I felt that we were very much called of God to be part of that process at that time. And uh, at this particular juncture, we couldn't be more uh, thrilled about uh, where things are and where we're heading. And I hope that some of you that are uh, connecting in, some of you online that are checking us out here, uh, will give uh, Corey a great opportunity upcoming months and upcoming weeks uh, that you might be able to connect in and just check out what's going on and be able to encourage him. Um, are you going to make some mistakes along the way, do you think? Absolutely. Okay. All I right. don't know if I made any yet, but okay. it's coming. All right, we'll work on that. Maybe by, there's, still, there's still a good bit of service to go here. So, um, But, uh, uh, and uh, church family, I, I hope that you would be uh, just as gracious to uh, to Corey and Becca and the kids, um, as you have been to me and my family. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, I think you are, but uh, um, I'm shifting. I just started a new role as uh, the, the coordinator of our fellowship of churches um, across, the, across the United States and Canada. And so um, I have some big shoes to fill there, and I'm on a massive learning curve as well, um, but very excited about who our fellowship of churches is and what we're able to accomplish for God's glory um, around the country and also around the world. So... Anything else to add before we move on here? No, I think that you you did well wrapping it up. And it's been really cool just knowing Tim for nine years almost or eight years and, and being able to step into this position. So, And I'm very thankful that Tim is here and willing to say all those very kind things about me as well. Um, but he's been awesome in just the transition, and, and I will still continue to text you and ask questions if that's very okay. Very good. I right, expect great. that. So, yeah, expect really awesome. That. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Can I uh, give a hand, round of applause uh, for them coming? And uh, I'm going to ask our uh, elders, uh, those elders that are here, uh, Wally, Mike, Chuck is here, Andrew's here, if you could just come up and just, uh, just stand behind them here, and uh, we're just going to ask a, a, a couple of you, two or three of you, just to have a word of prayer of blessing over them as a family. So um, if you want to grab a mic there, um, Wally, could you grab that mic, and remember to hold it up to your mouth. Last time we didn't have that happening, so um, if you could, uh, well, perhaps Wally, if you'd be able to pray, who else would like to uh, this morning here? Um, Chuck, would you be willing to do that? Okay, and, uh, and then we'll have Andrew, okay? That'll be great. So Wally, and then Chuck, and then Andrew. Thank you, guys. Father, we thank you this morning. Oh, you're good. Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity as we gather together here to welcome Corey and uh, Becca and the young family. And Father, we just thank you for, for their willingness, Father, to, uh, uh, to, re to beckon to your call and to uh, uh, recognize, Father, that this is a place that you're placing him and his willingness to do that. We pray, Father, for this vacant spot that he'll be leaving at the Branch Church. And we pray, Father, that you'll minister that to your glory. I pray, Father, for his ministry, Corey's ministry here as we gather together around him and to welcome him and to thank you, Father, for the direction that you have placed uh, uh, him in and his willingness to come once again, Father. So, Father, minister to us here in our fellowship and gather us around uh, Corey and, and his pastoral place here, Father. And, uh, a willingness to participate and uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, and to grow this fellowship, Father, and and I'd ask these things and all in in the name of Jesus Christ, mm. Amen. Mm. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to our church, with Pastor Corey and his family. We ask that you bl continue to bless our church and bless. Bless his family and bless Corey as he continues to, to grow. And although he may stumble along his way, that you may continue to guide him to be a godly man, to, gu to guide our church. And we thank you so much for all that you've done. In Jesus' name. 
Lord, thank you so much for just being able to see your hand in this transition, Lord. It has been a privilege and an honor to see you move, God, in incredible ways. And Lord, we are so excited and thankful for Corey and Becca and their family uh, being here with us, Lord. And we're excited to, to see how you use their ministry. Um, and Lord, I pray that you will be with us as a church family. May we support them, may we encourage them, and may we um, be gracious towards them. I pray that we will encourage them and be with them in this journey as they transition from Branch Life to here. And Lord, I pray for our church family in the, the weeks and in the months and the years ahead. May we continue to become more and more united in you, Lord Jesus. For this is your church. We are your people. And we want to help people live Jesus-centered lives. May you be with us in this transition. May you please be with Corey and Becca. Watch over them and bless them. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Um, that can just go down there if you want. Uh, just a few uh, announcements I'd like to mention here. Um, uh, up on the screen, we're going to show a picture here of uh, congratulations to Irv and Marlene Gingrich. Yesterday, they celebrated their 50th anniversary. I believe they're watching online, but if you could uh, give a round of applause to them, actually, that's pretty awesome. Love to celebrate those milestones. Uh, last, uh, last week, we started the Global Prayer Walk, um, and there's an opportunity to sign up for the month of November every day. Um, you can see the instructions up on the screen there. There's, if you text the word Karis to 55444, um, you can sign up for a, a daily email, which includes a little bit of information about uh, countries around the world where Fellowship of Churches is active, as well as some specific um, people serving in those countries um, and some specific needs that you can be praying for. And I hope you're engaging with that, and I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, join in. Um, this past week, we were learning about uh, Central Africa and Canada and Cambodia, and I think it's alphabetical by the sounds of it, but uh, we were looking at some of those things. Um, another announcement here, uh, CrossNet is one of our local ministries that we partner with, and um, we're going to have a little bit more information coming out this week. Uh, we'll be texting it through to you, uh, those that are regular part, as well as putting it on some of our other communication media, but uh, every year we come alongside and we partner with CrossNet uh, when it comes to providing providing some opportunities and some um some gifts and something for Christmas when it comes to a lot of the kids in our communities from some needy households. So more information on that to come. Did want to just give you that reminder uh, when it comes to um, our practices, um, regardless of where you're at when it comes to masks and no masks and social distancing or whatever, we ask that you please just be very respectful to other people. Uh, there's a verse up on the screen that you'll see in a moment here that just highlights there that we're to sympathize with each other, we're to love each other as brothers and sisters, be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. And then, of course, in Philippians 2, we're encouraged there to not just look out for our own interests, but to the interests of others. And we, our attitude should be like the attitude of Jesus Christ. And I just encourage us to keep that in mind there. Um, we're trying to just uh, have, a, have a realistic perspective of things, but I do encourage you, um, keep some of those distances there. Wear your masks when you're up out of your seat, and let's just one another well together during this season. Um, there are uh, some giving opportunities that we have as a local church. Um, COVID's hit us a little bit with that as well, so our giving is a little bit down, but I just want to encourage you, we have our online giving, which is available through a link on our website. We do have some uh, drop boxes by the exit doors and out in the lobby, as well as the opportunity to mail in anything there, but we love, we'd love it if you'd be able to continue to support the ministry that we're able to do here as a church family. And uh, kids, uh, kids today, the, uh, the pre-K um, are doing their stuff downstairs just now. And uh, in, a, in a few more minutes, not right now, but in a few more minutes, we're going to dismiss the elementary age students uh, for a little bit of a specific time for them. Um, but at this particular time, I'd like to ask you to draw your attention to the screen. We're going to show a video that has been produced by one of our ministries, Eagle Commission, um, and it just highlights some of, our, um, some of the things that are happening in regards to the veterans that have served that are part of our fellowship and beyond. And uh, so I encourage you to look at the screen and listen to what is shared. And then uh, Mike Lewis is going to come up and uh, lead us in a short time after that. Thanks. Every November 11th, our country sets aside one special day to honor all the men and women who served in the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, or Coast Guard. Each of these veterans selflessly served our nation, some for a short time, while others for a career. So on this Veterans Day 2020, and on behalf of the Eagle Commission, thank you to all our veterans everywhere for serving our country in the past. 
and for serving our Lord Jesus Christ now. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. President George Washington. We remember those who were called upon to give all a person can give. And we remember those who were prepared to make that sacrifice if it were demanded of them in the line of duty, though it never was. Most of all, we remember the devotion and gallantry with which all of them ennobled their nation as they became champions of a noble cause. President Ronald Reagan. The soldier, above all others, prays for peace. For it is the soldier who must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. General Douglas MacArthur. It's about how we treat our veterans every single day of the year. It's about making sure they have the care they need and the benefits that they've earned when they come home. It's about serving all of you as well as you've served the United States of America. President Barack Obama. The true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. G.K. Chesterton. On this Veterans Day, let us remember the service of our veterans, and let us renew our national promise to fulfill our sacred obligations to our veterans and their families, who have sacrificed so much so that we can live free. Representative Dan Lipinski. We just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge and say thank you to all of our veterans who are here today as well as joining us online. And so if you did serve um, in our military, if you could stand so that we could just acknowledge you. There's And I just want to take a moment to, um, to, to pray for all of our veterans and just thank God for their willingness to, uh, to serve. So, Lord, I, just, I thank you that you have laid on the hearts of men and women to, to serve and protect our country, that we have the freedom to worship you. Lord, I, I thank you um, that the Calvary Fellowship has um, the Eagle Commission with chaplains who are serving um, others in the military, leading them and guiding them in, in, in you, Lord. I ask that you just um, continue to protect the active military. And again, um, thank you for equipping people um, to serve others in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, one second as Andrew comes up here and go. Right now, if there are any kids from our kids' church ministry, elementary school, if you guys can head down. We have some of our volunteers hanging down there this way, heading down through these doors. So thank you guys. Any kids? Looks like we have some more. And if you haven't checked in yet, um, parents, you can head down as well. We do have a family welcome desk where you can check them in and then pick them up after service. There is an endless song Echoes in my soul I hear the music ring And though the storms may come I am holding on To the rock I cling How can 
can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King And it makes my heart want to sing I will lift my eyes in the darkest night For I know my Savior lives And I will walk with you Knowing you'll see me through And sing the songs you give How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King And it makes my heart I am loved by the King And it makes my heart I am loved by the King And it makes my heart Want to sing Thank you, God, for trusting me to be his dad. Thank you, Lord, that when a door closes, you're still going to take care of me. And thank you for cheetahs and pickles and failings and mommies and daddy. Thank you, Father, <laughs> for always giving me perspective. I'm so sorry. Thank you, God, that you are the great physician of both my body and my soul. Father, thank you for knowing my family's needs even before I do. And for ladybugs and old people and Disney movies and Miss Walker and donuts. Thank you for reminding me that I'm never alone. Thank you, God, for what I have. And also, I wouldn't mind an upgrade soon. And I want to speak to a manager. I'm sick and tired of trying to figure all this out. Thank you, Father God, for love, joy, peace, and patience. Lord, especially patience. And thank you for Jesse, even though he's mean during recess. Help him find a good friend. That's what he needs. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for childlike faith.
Wasn't that a good reminder? You know, it's hard to remember to be thankful in all times sometimes. Um, but I love that, how that video pointed out that in all things, you know, the good things in life, you know, the ladybugs and the donuts in life, we can be thankful for that. And even in the hard times, and it's good. That's such a good reminder. I know for me, especially finding myself here in 2020, is to be thankful in all things. Um, but for the next little bit, uh, things are going to look a little different than they normally do. Um, next week, we're going to hear more from Pastor Corey. Um, and uh, in the following weeks, uh, for right now, we're going to share a little bit of time, just the three of us. It's going to be a little laid back and whatnot. Um, we're going to share a little bit from Scripture. But before we get there, I'm just going to... Th- Throw the question out to Pastor Corey and Pastor Tim. What is something that you guys have learned this year in 2020? I'm sure there's a lot, uh, a lot of examples you could draw from different things, but what has God been teaching you this year? Uh, I think specifically for me, it's been interesting to kind of look back. If we went back to New Year's Eve, all of us, right, 2019, and said, what does your 2020 hold for you? I think many of us would have had a different view of what the year looked like and and things like that. And for me, what I've been learning, and I'll give you a couple examples of what that has looked like for me, but just learning that God's will and God's desire is not changed by my circumstances. And so certain things that have happened through our our year this year, first of all, uh, the one that comes to mind is the fact that we have Carter We didn't know that we were going to have Carter this year, right? But God's will was that we were going to have Carter this year. And all the other circumstances that surrounded that didn't change the fact that Carter has life. And God's desire was for Carter to be born. And that happened. Um, And so God's will was not changed. Um, Seeing some churches that we, this church, the church we were connected with, other churches we've known that have had to change the way we've done things over the last few months, Things look a little bit normal today, but the summer definitely didn't. The spring definitely didn't. But we still saw people come to know Jesus. We still saw people get baptized. We still saw churches grow. We saw churches merge. We saw new life come out of those things. Again, God's will didn't change because of the circumstances that we were looking at. And then lastly, the fact that we're here, right? We didn't know that we'd be here uh, this year. And so looking at God's will for our life that way. I think sometimes for me, I can look at circumstances and go kind of how can God do what he's doing, look at my circumstances, is he really doing what he's supposed to be doing, right? But we have to recognize that God's will doesn't, isn't impacted by circumstances so much bigger than that. And so I think I knew that, right? I would be able to say it, but understanding that and kind of seeing how that has played out this year has been really a big lesson for me, for sure. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, we, uh, we quoted it, I think Andrew mentioned it and I mentioned it last week, uh, just the, uh, the statement that flexibility is the key to ministry um, and just the reality that uh, in, in um, Western culture and, uh, and especially here in the United States, we like to often have things kind of ordered. We like to have things kind of neatly packaged the way we like them, um, except for our election process. That's not always orderly, is it? I can't figure that out. Every, every four years, it's like you're learning how to vote again. Um, it's very interesting. But... Uh, but we like to uh, we like to order things. We like to arrange things. We like to have this is what my schedule is. We like to plan ahead, and uh, just the reminder of the fact that um, that God uh, does want us to plan ahead. He does want us to save, and He does want us to be wise, and He does want us to do those different things. But at the end of the day, Scripture talks about we shouldn't say, "Well, I'm going to go and do this and do this and do this." But do you remember what the passage says in James? There, if the Lord wills we will do this. And if the Lord wills, we will do this. And just keeping in mind that um, throughout history, we see the fact that, uh, that God often uses times where our world is shaken up a bit to accomplish great things for His glory. And I will argue, I'll argue with you that, that, that times where the, the, um, the cause of Jesus has spread in more significant ways is not always during times when things are orderly and peaceful and nice and and exactly the way that we might want them to be. Oftentimes, God is glorified significantly in the midst of just some challenges that are going on. And I think uh, COVID has certainly thrown, thrown things our way and then just all sorts of things going on around the world has kind of caused that. But, uh, and so I'd, I'd encourage all of us to keep in mind the fact that, um, that if you look back at history, significant movements of God have not come out of times of, of calm, they've come out of times of, of challenge. And in reality, so many people, when life is going good, it's like, well, I don't really need God, or, or, or a relationship with God is kind of just an add-on extra. 
But when we are in a situation where we are crying out and we are desperate for him, I believe that is sometimes where we can grow significantly in our relationship with God and in our effectiveness in ministry to other people. So just a couple of thoughts there. How about you, Andrew? Yeah, I, I can definitely go off of what you shared there. Um, this past week, so I, I'm in school, and this past week for my one class, I had to write my personal testimony. And it was good to, to sit down and think through that again. And to realize that the seasons in life where God did the most in my life personally and where I have seen him use me um, to his glory has been those times where my world kind of went and kind of exploded. And in the season, I didn't want that. I didn't want that to happen. I liked where it was at because it was easy to put uh, the, my life into cruise control. And, uh, but then it all blew up, and that's when God did that heart change and worked within my life. And I see that this year where God has allowed us as a people, as individuals, as communities, as a nation, as a world to, hey, there's this, this challenge and are we going to um, let this challenge make us think more about ourselves or let this challenge make us think more about God and what he's doing here in the world. And I know for me, that's been a big thing this year, just letting God disrupt my, my life where I was in cruise control. I was getting into that point. It was comfortable. Um, and then letting that get disrupted was a good just kind of eye opener again, like, hmm, Maybe I'm not following Jesus in all the areas of my life that I think I am. And uh, being able to think through, hmm, am I being intentional with loving people and helping people know Jesus more? And so for me, that's been a big thing this year. Is, you know what? When, when life kind of explodes a little bit, let's see it as an opportunity. Let's be honest about the pain and the hardship, but let's see it as an opportunity to help people live Jesus-centered lives. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we're going to just for uh, the next little bit of time here, uh, we're going to just uh, take a little bit of time each. We're going to look at a passage um, in an Old Testament book. Um, I'm gonna, just going to talk about a couple of verses and then uh, Pastor Corey is going to talk about a couple of verses and then Pastor Andrew is going to talk about a few verses as well. And uh, this, uh, this particular passage is found in uh, the book of Isaiah. And I am not going to apologize for the way I communicate that word. Um, and, uh, but uh, Isaiah, that's how we say it in Australia. And when you have like Jeremiah, and my son's name is Benaiah, so um, I'm, I'm going to defend that, but that's all good. But uh, Isaiah, and, um, and a lot of times, every time I say that over the past, uh, I don't know how many years of ministry, um, people always get a little bit of a chuckle, so I'm going to make sure I say it lots of times today, seeming I'm shifting out of my lead role. But we're going to look at, um, it's going to be up on the screen here in a moment, but uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 45, and uh, looking at verse 1 and verse 3 here, and I'm going to ask those that are here, um, if you're able just to read, a, read out loud uh, from up on the screen there, it says this, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Now, there is a whole lot that is wrapped up in this particular chapter of uh, Isaiah's writings, and, um, and we're not going to hit a lot of that stuff today. There's all different levels that we could dive into. But uh, one of the things that's very fascinating about this prophecy is that God said through the words of Isaiah, he, he told Isaiah, in the future, there's going to be a leader, and this leader is going to help the Jewish people, and this leader, his name's going to be Cyrus, okay? And so, so 150 years later, just think about that, 150 years later, guess what happened? Well, the, the Babylonian Empire that was uh, governing in the region at that time was overtaken ultimately by the Persian Empire. And uh, one of the earlier leaders, in fact, the leader of the Persian Empire at that time who, who, who overthrew the Babylonian Empire, his name happened to be Cyrus. And I want you to think, just in perspective here, this would be similar to somebody in 1870 saying something and saying, this is what's going to happen in 2020, and then in 2020, that kind of takes place. 1870 was a long time ago. How many of you remember 1870? Anyone? No. Okay, that's a long time ago. And one of the things that uh, is uh, fascinating here too is that according to the first century Jewish historian Josephus, you've probably heard about him over the years, um, but, uh, but hearing this old prophecy, 
Cyrus recognized that it was about him, even though it was written a century and a half before he was born. And, and up on the screen here, you're going to see a little bit of a quote from, uh, from the Antiquities of the Jews, written by, in the first century by um, Josephus. Uh, he first quotes here, he says, My will is, talking from God, that Cyrus, whom I've appointed to be king over, over many and great nations, send back my people to their own land after that time of exile and build my temple again. Now, this is even before some of that had been destroyed. This was foretold... Josephus says, by Isaiah, 140 years, 150 years, somewhere there, before the temple was demolished, okay? So the temple was still there, and yet this prophecy talked about rebuilding the temple. You have to have it destroyed before it's rebuilt. And then it says there, accordingly, when Cyrus read this, these words of Isaiah, 150 years later, and admired the divine power, an earnest desire, and an ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written, and, and ultimately, so, so King Cyrus is reading this, somebody shared with him these words of the prophet Isaiah, and, and, and Cyrus is like, hey, that's me, that's even my name there. And, and these things that, uh, that was said in this prophecy, you know what, I'm going to do them. And ultimately, he eagerly participated in fulfilling that prophecy. Um, and not only did he allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem, he actually financed them. He sent letters with them. He did all sorts of things to be able to help that take place. It's really an incredible story. And in verse 4 of Isaiah 45, we read these words. It says, For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, God says, I, I summon you by, the na by name and bestow on you a, little, a title of honor. This is talking God talking to Cyrus. Uh, to bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, Cyrus, though you have not acknowledged me. And what I love about this passage as well is it just is a clear example of the fact that God is at work through human history. He is accomplishing His purposes according to His plan. And along the way, He uses people of faith, people who have put their trust in Him. And He also uses people not of faith, people who have not cho chosen to put their trust in Him. As you see in that particular verse, though you do not acknowledge me, is said a couple of times there. So Cyrus, as far as we know, never put his trust in God. As far as we know, that never happened, and yet God used him in history to accomplish some things that ultimately brought glory to God. And God uses good times to accomplish His purposes and to teach us and to grow us, and He uses difficult times to accomplish His purposes and to teach us and to grow us. And I don't know, how many of you out there um, in our auditorium today, how many of you, during a difficult time in your life, God taught you some stuff that you would never otherwise have known and learned? Anybody? Okay, we've got a full wave going on there. That's what happens. He uses, God uses seasons where things go the way that we want, and He uses seasons where things don't go the way that we want. God uses times of health, and He uses times of sickness. Um, just this week, um, uh, Gid Koblenz had a mild heart attack, um, and it's good to see you here, Gid. That is quite the recovery. It is awesome. Glad you came out here this morning. But, uh, but uh, there's times there where suddenly life stops, and we have to suddenly reprioritize our things that God often teaches us significant things. And Isaiah, in this, uh, this passage here, what he shares, again, we could go to deeper levels of some of what's contained in it, but Isaiah reminds us of the sovereignty of God. God works throughout history, and he uses leaders of all descriptions for His glory. And, uh, and sitting here today or listening from home, um, uh, the, the, the current, uh, it's hard to watch news, just uh, all the stuff that's going on, social media has been crazy in recent uh, months. Um, but uh, regardless, you might be glad about recent election results, you might be sad about um, recent election results. Regardless of that, while God uses all manners of leaders, salvation is never found in human government or those with temporary power and influence. Do you realize that? Nowhere in Scripture are we to, to, to um, sort of put all of our hopes and our dreams in government and politics and other things. As, as Americans, I'm not American, but as Americans, uh, you have the ability to vote and you should participate in that sort of process. But when we put our hopes in government, what ultimately happens whenever we put our trust in an individual who is not Jesus? What happens? We, we fail and we're disappointed. And that's because our, our leaning should be into who Jesus is and what He's about and God's plan and His sovereignty, not just in what we particularly want. 
Um, in Acts chapter 4, uh, we read these words. It says, for Jesus is the one referred in two in the scriptures. In verse 12 of Acts chapter 4, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And uh, have a look here at, uh, up on the screen, we're going to see verse 6 and 7 of Isaiah 45 where we read these words, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me, says God. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And I wonder sometimes if God does not allow disaster to happen in our lives in different ways, in personal ways, in order to say, you know what, I love you too much to have you just settled back and not living the way that you should be living. And, and I'm going to allow some things to happen that will hopefully cause you to reprioritize your life and to fix on your, your mind on the truths that are there. And sometimes we can lose sight of that reality of the fact that God is in charge. No matter what happens in life, good or bad, desirable or undesirable, God is on the throne. Can you say those words with me? God is on the throne. Ready? God is on the throne. Scripture teaches that again and again. And in personal experience, we've been able to observe that. And you've been able to observe that. So many of you who have a relationship with God. And that's awesome. A couple more things and then I'll hand over to um, Pastor Corey here. But uh, I uh, often remember. The, uh, I often remember the fact that just a few chapters later in Isaiah's prophecy, he says these words. He says, my thoughts, God, God says this, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And sometimes I think we can get a little bit of an idea that God, you don't know what you're doing and I know better than you. We might not say it in those words, but sometimes we have a little bit of a view that, God, you, we know what we're doing, and you, God, you're making some mistakes here. And I want to challenge you to think about, do you fully understand the concept of God being Lord and God being sovereign and God being providential with things? Because there might be some study of Scripture that needs to help feed your understanding of what the reality is. I believe the wise attitude of every believer should be to, the ask, to, to ask the question, Hey God, what do you want to teach me this year? What do you want to teach me this week? What do you want to teach me this month? God, what do you want to teach me today? I'm, I'm all ears. I want to grow in the way that you want me to grow. And I'm, and I'm willing and I'm wanting to. So God, please teach me and grow me and show me what you want from me and for me. And with that said, I'm going to hand over. You've got a couple more verses to launch into I here. I do, yeah. We're going to keep going, stay in the same chapter of Isaiah, and we're going to keep going good down. Job. Was that good? That's Did good. I nail it? Okay, good. We're going to work Great. on the G'day soon. Perfect. Okay? G'day. We'll All right. We can, we can try that. that. You'll have to refine that a bit more. <laughs> so we're going to jump down to verse uh, 9, and Tim, I'm going to ask if you can click for yep, me. Yeah, I've got it here, so. Okay, great. So uh, we're going to start with verse 9. We're going to go through verse 12 if you want to follow along, and, and we're going to hit a couple spots along the way, and I have one final idea to wrap us up. Um, at the end, but verse 9 says this, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but pot shards among the pot shards on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Now, I want to pause here and talk about a couple of things. First of all, another word that we don't use a lot is pot shard, right? Unless you do a lot of pottery, which maybe you do, I don't, right? It's something that we don't see a lot. Some of the translations have pot shard or they just have Pots. We're talking about just clay pots that have already dried, they're already done. And the picture here is that God is the potter and he's got a lot of pots just around and they're already done, right? And so we get compared to a little bit of this idea of the pot that has been created and is sitting there. And we are obviously all individual people, but God has made a lot. And the potter has looked at this room and there's a lot of pots here, right? The potter clearly knows what he's doing. But the first phrase in this passage is, woe to those who quarrel with their maker. And so the challenge here, like some of what Pastor Tim said, is the pots are kind of gathering around and looking at the maker and saying, you don't know what you're doing. The irony is the pots need the maker in order to exist, right? The pot cannot create its own self, just like we cannot create our own selves. We've needed God to do that. And as we go down to the second part, and this is in, in verse 9, I'll just go back to it. It says, does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Now, some of you may have a job where you work with your hands. That's what you do. Carpentry, maybe you're a mason, something like that. Or maybe you just have a hobby 
that you do with your hands. And so you've spent time creating. And what you like to do or some part of your day is spent creating with your hands. And when you get done that project, you enjoy being able to look at it and, and see the good work that you've done. And maybe you, even if it's a hobby, others have come along and said, wow, you're really good at this. And you take pride in what you do. Imagine someone came into your work or came into your home or your workshop or whatever it might be and looked at you and said, wow, do you even have hands? Did you use your feet to create that? And it, you'd look at them funny and say, what are you talking about? Well, they'd be insulting you, right? They'd be looking at your work that you put time and energy and effort into that you cared about and say, it doesn't look very good to me. This is the challenge, right? This is the question. Does do the pots, look at the potter, and say, do you even have hands? Imagine if we were to say that to God in, in our stance towards him. Do you know what you're doing? Let's go down to verse 10, and we'll keep going a little further into this idea that God lays out for us through Isaiah. Verse 10 says, Woe, yeah, woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? Now here, different situation, right? Now maybe you've been here. This would not happen with my son, but maybe you've gone to meet a new baby for the first time. And we all have this idea, right? Babies are typically cute. You know, that's what you're expecting. And you walk in and you take a look at the baby and maybe in your mind you go, that's not the cutest baby I've ever seen, <laughs> right? But I'm guaranteeing what you didn't say to mom and dad at that point was, that's not the cutest baby I've ever seen, right? You could have done better, right? You would never say that to them. Why? Because mom and dad, who are, by the way, sleep-deprived, and also are very prideful in their new baby, what you would have just said, and this is the way mom would have heard it, right? You think my baby's ugly. And the picture here that God puts forth through Isaiah is this idea of God going to this picture of a parent and saying, you wouldn't look at this child and look at mom and dad and say, what did you do, right? Right? You take pride and joy and be excited with mom and dad, even if that is what you think, right? But we're excited about it. And mom and dad love that baby, and they have the best in mind for that baby. And so God takes us to this place because we'll see in, in verse 11 here, if we could go there on the screens, it'd be awesome. So this is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker concerning things to come. Do you question me about my children? And the idea there is he wants to show his love for us right? He cares for us as children. There's a love there. There's a pride there. There's a desire to do what's best, right? So maybe you've been in this place, if you're a parent, right, where you have to do something that's unpopular with your children, but you know it's what's best. And do they look at you maybe and say, I don't understand why? Yeah, we've been in that position as parents. But we continue to do it anyway. Why? Because even though they don't get it, we do. And so, and so God takes us to this place to help us understand. And then he says, or give me orders about the work of my hands. And so then he goes to verse 12. We can go there. And it says this. It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens, and I marshaled their starry host. So God kind of goes on the offensive here, right? And says, listen, when you're questioning what I've made, when you're thinking, wondering, do I have hands, am I able to be in control? Not only did I create the place that you live, but I put you, created you and put you here, and I created all the stars that you see above you at night. That's what I was able to do. And so the last thought that I want to kind of land on with these, these few verses is just this idea. Those who have no hands should not question the work of those who do. And that's not to be insensitive to anybody who may not have hands, right? But it, the idea is those who cannot should not question those who can. One of the, I've taught people a lot of things. I've coached a lot of things. One of the things I've never taught anyone how to do is dunk a basketball because I've never done it, right? And I can't. So I shouldn't be the one who goes to somebody else and tries to teach them how to dunk a basketball. It just shouldn't happen. In the same way, we shouldn't look at God and say, you don't know what you're doing, right? Just like Pastor Tim said, he's on the throne and he understands. And sometimes we have to check our motivation and the way that we're looking at God and understanding who he is and say, I have to sit back and go, I, I can't do what God does. So I have to trust that he's in control. Now, we do this on a right, now, many of us haven't been on a plane for a very long time. But we put our, ourselves right in a place, if you've been on a plane, like, you're trusting the pilot. If they said you need to fly the plane, you know you'd be in the wrong spot. It's the same idea with God. 
We have to allow him to do those things. And when we, again, go back to the idea I shared about circumstances. When we look at our circumstances, it's easy for us to go, God, I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. I don't get this. I don't like this. But we have to, again, put ourselves in perspective and remember, we are the ones who cannot do what God has done. And we have to trust him to do what only he can do. That's Pastor awesome. Andrew. That's awesome. Just one thing. Um, sure. Our uh, church uh, basketball hoop up the back there slides yeah. down the pole. Oh, great. So you'll be able to dunk so that now one I'll pretty be able good. To dunk. So Thank you'll you be able to at least do that one. So. <laughs> Pastor Andrew. Awesome. All right. So we're going to stay in the same chapter of Isaiah. And uh, my Australian isn't very good, so I'm going to proudly be American there. That's so good. That's but uh, good. we're now in ch- uh, verses 22. We're going to be in the last few verses of the chapter. And uh, I love what you guys shared about how God is he's sovereign. He uses people who are faithful to him. He uses people who aren't faithful to him. Um, and he, he, he's the one who's created us. He's put the stars in the sky. And although we question him so much and we talk back to the potter, our God still gives us an invitation. Our God, despite the fact that we have rebelled against him, he still loves us despite the fact that we are frail and we so often turn our backs on him. He still invites us. So in verses 22, it says, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. My mouth is uttered in all integrity, a world that will not be, revo- a wor- a world that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. I love the fact that no matter who you are, God asks you and invites you to turn to him. Um, This year, 2020, there's been a lot of places that people have turned to. You know, in that that verse it says, turn to me and be saved. Every single person on earth is turning somewhere to find salvation from the issues in their life. Hmm. Some people, they they turn to comfort. So they they go to Netflix or they open up the fridge. And I'm I'm guilty of that. I love going to the snack cupboard and finding the the snacks that I want to (laughs) give me that comfort, that salvation for that day, for that problem. Everybody has those things. Some people, it's work. Some people, it's family. Some people, it's, a, it's a countless other things. And many things that we go to to be saved, uh, to that we go to and say, hey, save me from the problems of my life. Save me from the issues of 2020. A lot of those things aren't necessarily bad things in and of themselves, right? Mm-hmm. I know for me, a lot of the things that I can go to, comfort, snack food, whatever, those things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. But they can't save me from the real issue in my life. The real issue is the fact that we are pieces, we are pots, and we've tried to talk back to our maker, and we've broken that relationship with him. And we need to be saved uh, to, and to be brought back into that right relationship. Sin is the issue in all of our lives. The issues of 2020 pale in comparison to the eternal problem of our sin. Hmm. But isn't it easy, I know it's been easy for me this year, to not look at the eternal and to just look at... When will 2020 be over? It's been so hard. It's so unknown. And so I love that our God says, hey, turn to me, be saved, for I am your God. If you could put those verses back up on the screen, it says, or if you go back to the last ones, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. That's an invitation to all people. You know, Isaiah, when he's talking, he's talking to all people. That's including us, not just uh, the Israelites, but even to the Gentiles, the non-believers. He says, for I am God and there is no one. By myself, I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity. Basically, God's saying, hey, you can trust me. I've said these things, my mouth is full of integrity. And going down, he says, before me, every knee will bow, by me, every tongue will swear. Now, I want us to realize something. God has given this invitation for us to turn to him, to be saved. And not everybody's going to do that. Maybe you're here today listening or online, and maybe you've never turned to God to be saved. But the reality is, whether you have or not, one day we will all bow before God. One day we will all acknowledge him. And the question is, will we be bowing before him out of a desire because we've turned to him in worship? Or will we be bowing to him out of the realization at the end of time that he was my maker and I shouldn't have talked back to him? Hmm. We're all going to do that. And if you continue on verses 23 and 24, it says this, as they will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. Those who turn to him know that there is deliverance and strength in our God from this thing called sin. But then it says, all who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. All those pots who have raged against their creator, they're going to be put to shame. So whether you turn to him or not, all of us are going to one day bow before him. The question is, will it be out of worship or will it be out of his judgment upon us? 
But it goes on, and it gives this awesome hope. I love it. It says, but all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. All, but all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will boast in him. The descendants of Israel, the covenant people of Israel, will be delivered. Will be delivered from this issue of sin. And we will boast in him. It's awesome. And so, as I, just wrapping up, just want to ask you, are you bowing before our God today? Now, eternal life doesn't just start when we die. Eternal life starts now when you place your faith in Jesus. Jesus says this in, in John 17, 3, that this is eternal life, that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. It's about this relationship. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you've never turned to God, this is an invitation for you to come to bow before him, to be saved. You know, he, he can do all things. He's sovereign, as Pastor Tim's talked about. He is, he is um, the one who has created you and he's created the stars, as Pastor Corey talked about. But he wants us to turn to him. He gives us that choice, and we can choose to say no to it. So if you haven't, I encourage you today, talk to someone about it. Put your faith in him. Turn and be saved. But if you're here today and you have turned to be saved, I just want to ask you this. Are you living as though you've turned to be saved from your sin? I know for me this year, I, I know that I'm saved. I know I have salvation. I'm secure in my relationship with Jesus. But it's so easy for me to get distracted by all these distractions and all the problems and to get up and stop bowing before him. It's so easy to do that and to start thinking, hmm, maybe my deliverance isn't in Jesus. Maybe it's in, in this thing or this thing or once 2020 is over, then things will be good. And it's so easy for me to stop turning to the God who has saved me. And so whether you're a Jesus follower here today or not, all of us need to remember we need to turn to our God. If you're saved, you've turned to him, you're secure in that. But it's so easy for us to still turn our eyes to other idols around us, to other things in the world that we want to try to find comfort in. So today, uh, if you know Jesus, I encourage you, think about it. Are you turning to Jesus this year? In the midst of 2020, in the chaos, keep turning to him. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Corey. Um, you guys can head on down. Um, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Um, and as they do, um, just, uh, just a passage I was looking at uh, just recently here. I just want to read it to you. It's a couple of verses that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. And that's another little practical, um, practical application thing that this is what God wants us to do. You want to know what God's will is? Um, this is what uh, was said. I, I urge you, first of all, Paul said to Timothy, to pray for all people. Who did he want uh, Timothy to pray for? All people, okay? Pray for all people. Ask God that, to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Give thanks for who? What people again? Huh, interesting. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Verse 3 says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. And I just want to challenge, uh, I don't know where you're at when it comes to different problems that our world and that our country is facing in different ways. I don't know where you're at with things. But can I challenge you, before you state your position, before you argue your particular point of view, can I encourage you, have you prayed for them? Have, whether you people that you like or don't like, have you prayed for them today? Have you prayed for God to bless them? Have you prayed for God to work through them? Because what happened with Cyrus years ago? Did God use Cyrus who, who never acknowledged him as God? Yes, he did. And God's going to use people of all different persuasions around the world for his glory because he is king and he is on the throne. And whatever situation you're in right now, um, the words to this next song just talk about the fact that we see God's hand at work and we desire to see God's hand at work. And I, I hope that in the coming years of ministry here at Grace Family Church, as Pastor Corey steps on into this role, I hope to see um, growth and vibrancy take off even more than it has in the recent years. And I'm excited by the potential that we have. May God use our church family here to share the truth of his gospel all around to people who need to hear it. So if, uh, if you're able to and, uh, and interested to, you're welcome to stand as we sing this song. And uh, then after that, Pastor Corey's just going to come and uh, wrap up our time together. But thank you for joining us. And uh, let's sing together now about these words. Walking around these walls 
I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. my confidence you've never failed me yet I've seen you move
Well, thanks everyone for coming and joining us again today. Thanks for watching online if you're still sticking around. If we haven't got a chance to meet yet, I would love to get to know you. I'm going to be standing just outside the auditorium here. Feel free to come say hi. I'm going to pray uh, just to end our time this morning. Lord, we're so thankful that we can come uh, and worship you together and learn more from your word. Um, and we just ask that those who are not with us, they're watching from home, that they would feel as connected as possible, that we would be able to uh, connect with them in a different way. Uh, we pray for everyone that's here and, and watching online also, that you would keep us healthy, keep us safe from harm. And if there are times of sickness that come, that you would um, just help us to grow through that sickness uh, as well and see those times that um, Tim talked about a little bit earlier where things are a little bit difficult but yet we still grow through them. And we pray that we would see those opportunities in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for coming. Have a great week.